Good to know because I'm on, on it all day. <laughs> uh, all right. Here we go. My name is Roger Burnett. This is the So You're in Sales podcast. I have the good fortune to be joined today by the principal and founder of Tenbound, David Delaney, who is uh, in the middle of his workday because he's out there in Silicon Valley. So we're very grateful to David for joining us today. David's got a very interesting background when it comes to uh, data analytics and research. So this is not going to be David's opinion. This is going to be research and data-driven information. So if anybody wants to play skeptic out there, we got the data to back it up, folks. So David, <laughs> thanks for joining me today. I'm really glad that you're able to come on the show. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm, uh, I hope I can uh, provide some data-backed value to the listeners. <laughs> you bet, you bet. I'm sure, I'm sure you got the goods, man. I put you through the ringer enough during the, uh, the show premise development that uh, here we sit. So uh, before we jump into the meat of the discussion, why don't you give a little bit of a background on Tenbound and what that business is all about? I, help it, I think it'll help frame the discussion just a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So most uh, tech companies have an SDR team. So you might have heard that, that term, SDR, BDR. And it's essentially the, the way that they structure their sales team is they've got a, a dedicated team that's doing the prospecting, the cold calling, and, and following up on inbound leads. And then they, they'll hand over the demo to the sales team once they do all that hard work at the upfront. So what we do is really specialize in that SDR sales development world. And we run you know, benchmark reports, surveys, and do research on you know best practices in that area, and then we bring them together. You know the community is growing. There's a lot of tools and people involved, so we do uh, you know a lot of uh, conferences, virtual events, and you know education opportunities to help people grow their network in that area. So I'm I'm intrigued. How does one end up wanting to create a business for themselves in this area? You know tech and especially SDR teams and things like that oftentimes are very Silicon Valley based, very technology company focused. So what was your impetus to uh, step out on your own? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I ask myself that a lot, you know, because everything's all about VC and, and product launches and building software. And I'm, you know, sort of looking in from the outside going, that looks really cool. Uh, but, it, you know, I, I had been running sales development teams at, at tech companies. And, um, you know, when I was kind of at a crossroads and I, I wanted to do my own thing, um, I looked at, you know, what, what would be a, a tool or a software product that would support sales development. And I, I really kept coming back to the fact that there wasn't one sort of industry center for the what was a burgeoning industry that was forming, uh, the sales development industry itself. And I, I think where it really hit me was, uh, I approached a, a friend of mine who did sales conferences and said, why don't we do a sales development conference that really focuses on the SDR world? And he was just like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm over it. I, I don't want to do it. And I said, well, fine, I'll do it, you know? And <laughs> um, it, I wish it was some kind of grand plan, but I, I just saw a, a need, you know, in the marketplace for, you know, good research-based, um, you know, content and, and advice on how to do it, and then a way for the community to get together. And so that's, that's you know, four years <laughs> plus. And so is there actually an annual event pre-COVID that that came as a result of that desire to try to do that? There was, yeah, we did our first one in 2017 in San Francisco and yeah, very pre-COVID, right? So it was your traditional um, non-vendor you know, conference. And when I say non-vendor, there's a lot of uh, software companies you know, here in the Silicon Valley that put on conferences. You know, sure. Obviously the Dreamforce conference used to be, you know, couple hundred thousand people, you know, for yeah. a week in San Francisco. So our, ours, ours was more of the kind of the, the Gartner angle where we're, we're acting as sort of the industry center to bring all these tools and services and people together for a conference. Yeah, we did the first one in 2017. 
it went in very well. I mean, it, it was amazing the, the reaction that we got and kept doing live ones up to 2019. Um, 2020, you know, had big plans to expand, you know, to New York and, and uh, Dublin, Ireland, and um, just completely got my, you know what, kicked. Right, sure. sure. <laughs> like every, probably everybody else on the call. So how's 2021 looking? Are you going to try to do something or are you going to wait till 22? You know, it was interesting because we, I had been, I'm kind of old school, obviously, and, and everything was always in person. You know, we would go to the client's office to do advisory meetings. We, we had in-person training. We had in-person conferences, you know, and that's just the way that I was. I came up, you know, I, I sold sales training for seven years earlier in my career. And but I knew in the back of my head that we had to, you know, shift the business to digital because it was just you know it's the the way that people did business before covid um sure. and you know 2020 like i said it slapped me in the face and and long story short everything is now digital that we do so we did two very successful um virtual conferences in 2020 um we're doing three this year and, um, and then all of our training, advisory stuff, obviously the media stuff that we do, everything's digital now. So, uh, you know, it's too raw right now, but I guess COVID was kind of a good thing in the way that it forced us to do that. Forced metamorphosis has been the order of many of a podcast episode here on the So You're in Sales podcast, dating back probably now three, four months, right? So yeah. it, it, it really is, we, we've, we, we're we no longer in that space where we're just trying to figure out what it is that we're going to do with the rest of our lives. We're yeah. now much more looking at how do we use this transformation to our uh, competitive advantage for those of us who have been able to make that transition in a way that allows an audience to follow along with us in a non-in-person environment. Although as a person who sells promotional marketing items, we are desperate for in-person events to come back because that's where all the swag gets handed out. But uh, it's yeah. been interesting to watch all of that occur. What, what have been some of the revelations that you've had uh, in this period of time when you've been able to do some of your virtual events? Yeah, and just to, to, you know, a little hope on the horizon, by the way, is we have a live event planned for October, the end of October in San Francisco you know, with masks and seats, you know, 10 feet apart and all sure. this. Stuff. So it, it, there's green shoots coming up. I would love to get back. I, I you know, I love talking to you, you know, but but doing vir uh, uh, virtual events, you know, it's one piece of the pie. I, I'd love to get back to in-person, you know, as soon as it's ready and we're planning to. So yeah. I just wanted to <laughs> put that out there. Um, yeah. And, you know, to your question, I, you know, we, we had been, we're very small, you know, uh, I think six people um, and a bunch of contractors and, and fivers and Upworks, you know, very nimble company. And even before COVID, we, it was all work from home. We had a WeWork, you know, office where we, I, I loved going, you know, two, three times a week, meeting people and just, you know, interacting, getting out of your house, you know, um, but but we were pretty nimble, you know, going into COVID um, as far as how the company was set up. We were already using Zoom and Slack and cloud-based, you know, everything. So so that that wasn't a big deal, but it was, um, you know, uh, the the taking the um, the the value that we got from the products, you know, that we that, that we you, uh, you know, have with our customers and making sure that, that, that they have the same value in a digital format. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. and the biggest one was the in-person conference. Like we were known for um, people just loved it. I mean, they love to be able to go and like just geek out on this niche topic for a day, you know, and they made friendships and, you know, it was just an awesome experience. And, and so it's like, how do we put that into a virtual environment? And, um, you know, we 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 learned a lot, uh, you know, and hopefully, you know, getting better with each one. Which platform did you use for your virtual events? Yeah, you know, um, it's called AirMeet. 
Okay. And, um, you know, it's a long, torturous story. I won't get into <laughs> their audience, but we tried a lot of different ones. And, um, you know, it was kind of the wild, wild west there, right? In early 2020 and into the summer last year when sure. so suddenly, you know, this very sleepy virtual conference industry just blew up. And it was it, so we tried a lot of different ones and we found air meat. There was startup, very scrappy, great customer, you know, experience, and and um, they offer a lot of great, you know, programs and stuff for the people coming to the virtual conference. So we we like it a lot. There you have it, listeners. Air meat. That's not one that I think we've heard previously. So hopefully that you out there are, if you if startups are your jam and you like working with people who are just making their way out into the world, perhaps Air Meet might be a platform for all of you to consider. It, that's one of the biggest, you know, there's really two elements to it. It's uh, how do you take what used to be an in-person event and not just so, sort of like, oh, now it's a virtual event. It's, that just doesn't work. You have to reimagine the way that you want to create that uh, attendee experience in a way that can fit into the platform in an elegant enough way to make it be something that people would want to actually attend. And that's not easily done. So kudos to you for being able to pull it off. So. As you know, uh, Dave, a lot of our audience are smaller businesses that uh, oftentimes will be five or less employees in an organization. We do have some larger uh, sales-based organizations within our industry as well that have most likely probably already made that transition to an SDR team. But we'll have a lot of people that will be listening to this and say, well, I just don't perceive myself to be a large enough organization to want to consider building a team like this because they would perceive it to be expensive and time consuming and maybe take them away from their individual sales efforts. So is there, in your mind, is there some threshold point that something like this topic makes sense for a specific size of business or a, a particular type of organization? Like speak on that. Yeah, it's it's tricky because it is it's an investment, um, you know, to to have a dedicated resource to to do, you know specialize for sure, and 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 so you know as a company is coming up, the sales rep can probably handle everything, you know, they, they just do the cold calling and do the inbound lead qualification and then run the meetings and take care of the customers. Like, you know, if, if the sales rep can handle it and everything's going great, then, you know, you're, you're, you're good to go. Where, where we see it sort of the break point is if the sales rep is, is um, busy with doing actual sales activities. So, you know, we like to say like belly, belly, with an actual qualified customer and do, doing sales calls most of the day and, and, and other, you know, sales related activities and the prospecting, you know, the cold calling and, and the um, really qualifying all the inbound leads that come in is starting to fall to the wayside because the sales rep is so busy, then you may want to look at having someone focus on that area and just making sure that the sales reps calendar is full of actual sales activities um, because it, it, you know you can plug it into a spreadsheet there's there's sort of a tipping point between having a, a highly paid highly compensated individual doing cold calling and following up on inbound leads and things like that when um, they're better spent using their sales skills to push people to a to a deal close versus you know, um, uh, spending their day researching, pulling up phone numbers and, and doing all the stuff that SDRs do. Yeah. High value activities versus time consuming activities are often the challenge that we see in businesses that are um, most often listening to our show. And the frustration that I hear from many of my peers when we're just sitting around having beers and, and talking about the things that are creating pain for our businesses. You hear something along the lines of, if only I could just, yeah. then I would be able to. And what I love about what you've done is that you've brought this element of research to the conversation to be able to, instead of it trying to be a gut feeling or something instinctual to say, 
you know, let me wander off into this direction and see if there's any value to be had here. The thing that I will uh, draw a parallel to that we see a lot of times happen with, especially within the promotional marketing industry is the use of virtual assistants. And people will say like, there's clerical skills that I have, but the dollar value that I generate from clerical skills pales in comparison to when I use that same time for sales-based activities. And there, there is sort of a, a, a line drawn in the sand of people who will say, well, I just would never spend the money on something like that because that's lost profit dollars. But I think this in many ways, as much as virtual assistance, it's what's the potential growth opportunity for you in total revenue within your business that you could realize were, if you were able to offload some of those um, what we'll call lower value, time consuming kind of activities that SDR kind of fills that gap for. So just talk a little bit about like when we talk about the meat and potatoes of what sales development really looks like for the average business, what would you want to share with the listeners when it comes to that? Yeah. And, you know, just pulling that thread a little bit, uh, it, you know, th you can start small here. If you if you start to look at what it takes to do prospecting and breaking that out into, you know, uh, chunks of time, um, Upwork and Fiverr are, you know, good entry level options just to start to take some of that off your plate. And so to your point, I think it's a bigger conversation around do you do you do you have a good idea about what activities as an entrepreneur make you the most money and where you really should be spending the majority of your time? And are there you know, other activities where you just sort of have to do it because there's nobody around to do it and you might as well, but it's actually not the best use of your time. And you know, sales development, you know, as we're talking about today is I would, I would bet one of those things, you know? And, and so to your question, what, what actually is sales development? Well, okay, so you could break it out into outbound and inbound. And, and so, you know, just very briefly, outbound is basically identifying your target market of, of accounts, you know, and if you're going B2B, and we mostly work in the B2B industry, so I'll just go there, but target accounts that would make a big difference for your company that you really wanna break into. Now you got to figure out who works there that's involved some somehow in the evaluation or decision making of your product. And then you got to reach out and have some kind of conversation with them. And that could be a phone call, an email, a social touch, et cetera. And, you know, very basic framework. But if you think about it, there's a lot that goes into that as far as you know, you got to find the list of the target accounts, you got to vet them out, you got to find the people, you got to get their contact information, and then you got to sit down and call them. And, and you know, uh, people are busy these days, it's hard to get in touch with them. Sometimes you got to reach out, you know, several times. And and then once you get them on the phone, you got to know what to say, you know, sure. and, and um, you know, as a busy business owner or a sales professional, I mean, who, who wants to sit there and do that all day? So that's outbound. Uh, and then you got inbound, you know, which is hopefully you're getting some leads. And, um, you know, what most salespeople do is they kind of sort them out. They look at what has the best potential and then they follow up on the, you know, the cream of the crop because they just have there's a short amount of time during the day. You know, so they they follow up on the best one. So meanwhile, there's, you know, whole there could be whole lists of inbound leads that nobody's called or emailed in the last three months. And um, that that's another activity. Somebody's got to you know sit down, map out the account, call them, maybe call somebody else that works there, update the database, you know, just make sure that you're touching those enough. So, for those of us who have had some classic sales, classic sales training, I guess is the best way to put it. What we're really talking about is your funnel, right? Yeah. And and what comes out of your funnel is your pipeline. Pipeline leads you to sales. It, like okay, so. Those are not difficult concepts to understand, but within your down funnel movement, if you can segment out the activities that are necessary to move someone from the top of your funnel to the bottom, SDR teams actually have the opportunity to fill gaps in every one of those places, depending on where you're weakest. So it would make no sense whatsoever to go out and hire someone to do more of what you do best. In reality, what you should be looking for is 
where does your pipeline have a tendency to have weaknesses that develop within it? Because that's most often where you and your individual sales skill have yet to really be able to kind of make that muscle work really well. And if you can outsource that piece of it, train the team in what it was that you would want said and done in that period of time, what you're really doing is you're adding rocket fuel to your sales process because you've essentially cloned yourself in that space where you struggle the most. And it's almost as if you teach your trainer to teach you how to develop what it is that you're not doing very well so that your pipeline never suffers. Because what I see in individual contributor environments, our company is set up the exact same way. If I move a fair number of my accounts down funnel and into the pipeline, oftentimes it's at the expense of more prospecting. And what you see in that is I'll have a really great quarter followed up by a not so hot quarter. And that's because I had to divest my attention from prospecting to making sure that we got those deals over the finish line. And lo and behold, you look at your pipeline and you hold your head in your hands because my God, look at what I've done to myself in the process. And the thing that we all know to be 100% true right now is that the frequency or the interval between decisions on the client side has got extraordinarily long. And we have to wait a tremendous amount of time for yeses or noes really from our clients when they're at the bottom of the pipeline. And if you're focused all of your time and attention on that yes or that no, you may really be putting your pipeline in peril because you're not spending any time in that prospecting activity that you really need to keep going for the lifeline of your business to continue. So that's all, it's really, really sm smart thinking when it comes to where can I strategically add other members of another organization without having to bring on the expense of a headcount to make that part of what I need to have happen be buffeted, to be cushioned, to be augmented, you know, whatever that, that, um, that part of it is. What do you see a specific area in the pipeline or in the funnel that people will come and approach you to try to help patch? Like, is there an area there that, that stands out more often than not? Yeah. I mean, well, you know, the whole sales development team, you know, concept is, is relatively new. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, in the last 10 years, 10 years really yeah. salesforce.com is, is the company that kind of popularized it. Right. And, yeah. and, um, and then, a, a, a guy who worked there sort of documented their process and wrote a book called Predictable Revenue, uh, which is is really what we're talking about here. You know, you don't want that lumpiness in the pipeline, and that's why you have a dedicated team. And so, you, you know, it, it's sort of dogmatic now in Silicon Valley that you get some, you get a little investment money, and you've got a good product, and like now we've got to hire an SDR uh, sales rep and somebody to take care of the customers at least, you know, and, and where we see it, ha you know, uh, you know, issues happening is they hire two, three, four SDRs and there's, there's no like necessary, like what you were talking about. Nobody has taken the time to write a playbook, right. you know, an SDR playbook and given them a process and, you know, let them know what the expectations are. So they're just kind of, all over the map and they're taking direction from their sales person and, and it, it's not as structured as it should be. So where they really come to us is like, hey, we've got the, a team, but their process, you know, is either non-existent or they're not following it or we're not getting the results that we need from, from the SDR team. And so, you know, for the folks that are listening to this, you know, first and foremost, sit down, even if it's just a whiteboard or a piece of paper and kind of like you said, write down your prospecting process at the top of the funnel on how the ideal situation should be. You know, at least so you, you're starting from from a, a, a you know a set process, and then if you do end up using an outsourcer or you hire somebody in house, at least they have a initial playbook to go off of. And um, and you know one of the real bottlenecks that we see is that initial data, you know, data cleansing, I guess you could call it. So getting the list of 
the target accounts and getting the list of the people, prioritizing them, and then getting the phone numbers and the email addresses. Right there is a lot of work, you know? And, um, you know, sometimes it'll take the SDR a while when they first come in, they're not even actually talking to anybody yet. They're just trying to get the list straight. So yeah. that we see that a lot. Yeah, a lot of times when you ask people who their target client is, they say anyone who has money. And <laughs> while that is a strategy, while that is a strategy, that is not necessarily the most effective or efficient strategy for a salesperson. You know, a lot of times it's I get a referral, I create an opportunity, I make a proposal, and hopefully I get a sale. And that's pretty basic. And you know, what we're saying to you is that this is still that same process, but there are elements within each of the phases of that, that if someone goes from, I got a referral, we got an appointment, and then we never get to proposal, it doesn't mean you should stop talking to that person, people. This is what we're saying mm -hmm. is, that's when exactly. it's time to implement strategies that give you a chance to get that person back to where you get to a proposal phase. And for, for those of us who are managing a book of business, there's only a certain amount of prospects that an individual can manage without technology and resources and things that the average small business person doesn't have. So by being able to devise something that you can hand off to people that when you recognize, okay, like this particular company, it's been six weeks since the last time we spoke to them and they're not really responding to anything that I'm sending them. It doesn't mean it's time for that client to go away. It means that's the exact right time to start adding these pieces back into the to the soup so that you have an opportunity to bring that person back. And especially when you may have the opportunity to do that without you even having to actually be the one doing the work. And then the other piece of this that I wanted to touch on, what you're talking about in the uh, client investigation phase, a lot of the folks in my space like to call that deep work. And it's called deep work just because it takes a lot of time. And yeah. if you can set up a profile of what are the key attributes of an organization that would fit your best prospect or client profile, you absolutely can hand that work off to someone to do that quote deep work. So that by the time that you get that client profile back, you know who it is that you're supposed to be speaking with and whomever it is that's done that work for you, hopefully, can express to you based on the information that you shared with them why they thought this person would be the candidate that they wanted to bubble up to you. So imagine if instead of you having to wake up tomorrow morning and figure out who are the 25 new people that I want to add to my prospecting list, you open up your computer and there was a list there waiting for you. I mean, my goodness, that I, I like when it works and when it's successful and you can look at organizations that have had rapid growth, a lot of times this is the key element that even the business themselves don't even always realize that like, wow, that was the thing that really took off for us when we decided to make that decision. So what other benefits have you seen people realize as a result of implementing that kind of strategy? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, um, you know, it's it's almost a cliche now, but but things have changed so much just in the last 10 years in the the tools that are available that have been made available by the technology advances and the cloud cloud based technology advances and uh you know there are literally you know if you take the time to document the things that you're doing that that are time consuming but but could make a really big difference there are you know thousands millions of people out there that would love to take that off your hands and do it at a fraction of the rate that you could do. So it's it's the same thing. I think pe people have a really hard time with, you know, delegating because it's it is the deep work at the upfront to get get the process down on a piece of paper and then spend a little bit of time training someone, but the but the, you know, re reward of doing that it can be so exponential right now compared to just a few years ago. You know, so um you know, another another thing that we see uh, coming up with this a lot is uh, initially when people start to get some sales traction, they have that referral base and they're getting a referral to an inbound lead to a to a deal. But uh, you know, I think with the rise of sales development, most of the the companies out there that that have these teams have realized, 
you can only really go so far with that. And, and again, it's not predictable because, you know, you're, you're waiting. waiting. It's yeah. Yeah. The, this is the proactive activities that have to be happening, like kind of on the side to make sure that you don't have that lumpy pipeline that you were talking about. I call it the WD-40 for the inside of the funnel. Literally, <laughs> like you're yeah. trying to make it be as frictionless a, a move from the top of the funnel to the bottom as possible. And to think that each of us would somehow be able to do that individually we're probably not being real truthful with ourselves if that's what we think we're going to be capable of doing because we probably would all be selling more if we were already capable of doing that. So it's really a matter of sort of looking at your own business and looking at what your goals are and looking at where you may place a strategic investment or two in order to be able to make that actually work for you. So David, from a cost perspective, yeah. what's kind of the entry level to like where, where what, what ballpark are we talking about from a cost perspective? Yeah. So again, you know, it can go from doing it yourself, you know, putting some focus time in on sales development type of activities if, if you're not yet. And um, I, that, that goes back to what's the value of your time? You know, is it right. the best use of time? But I mean, literally, you know, if you want to be watching Game of Thrones and doing uh, prospect research and getting phone numbers off the internet. I mean, that's that's one way to do it. Uh, I'd say that the next level up from there is the the international, you know, marketplaces that are out there, the Upworks and the Fivers, you know, that, um, you know, we're talking 10 bucks an hour, you know, to, right. to scour through your database and, and find names and phone numbers or, or literally reach out to people on your behalf and things like that. And you can scale that up and down based on your budget and how much value you're getting. Uh, no long term, you know, employment contract. <laughs> you know, it's 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 amazing. Um, and then up up from there is there's a universe of outsourced SDR companies. You know, they they range from, you know, just a, a few people to you know, multi multinational, you know, million dollar companies that that just focus on doing uh, sales development work for for companies, and and that could be a, a good bridge, you know, to the next phase, which is hiring someone either part time or full time that actually works at your company, and um, you know, usually in that case, they're paired up with your sales rep, and um, they they act as the prospecting and the lead qualification engine for your sales rep. And, and then, you know, from there, there's, there's SDR. I mean, we just did a, a survey um, recently and, you know, there's over 2000 SDRs at, at salesforce.com. Wow. Um, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. And, and they, they were the, they're one of the biggest there's Oracle, there's Adobe, you know, those big tech companies, Right. Just have legions of these people all over the world who this is all they're doing all, all day. So that's that's the extreme sure. you know example that's sure. not really relevant. <laughs> but I but I think what you're yeah. saying is it doesn't have to be cost prohibitive for the small business person to be able to decide to make this be a part of what they're doing and from their sales efforts. Yeah, I mean. You know, the, with a little self-study, you go to like the Wikipedia, you know, <laughs> you know, go to Wikipedia, go to YouTube, uh, buy a few books on on Amazon. And, um, you know, you could definitely do it yourself at, at the beginning and then just scale it up from there. All right. So final question. You're the data research guy. What's the single biggest data point that you would want my listeners to walk away from this conversation with? Oh gosh! I mean, we just got we just got a really interesting report from LinkedIn on messaging, um, and I just I just pulled it up. It was uh, the shorter the messages, the higher the response rate. So as you're thinking about you know reaching out to cold prospects or even in like business communication, I, I think what this is telling us is. That uh, the the shorter, the more, uh, you know, to the Concise. point. The, yeah. yeah. To TLDR. <laughs> I am, I am, uh, friends of mine are giggling right now because they accuse me of being very long-winded when it comes to these kind of things. So there you have it, folks. Don't be long-winded like Roger. 
get right to the <laughs> point, be concise, make sure that you, it is, you know exactly, because you and I both have had that LinkedIn connection straight to pitch conversation, and that is a not fun thing to have to go through. So having something of value and being able to say it in very few words to the people that you're trying to make connections with on those social platforms is really where the secret sauce is in trying to make that work for you. So, uh, hey, so David, thank you for coming on. I wanna give you a chance to talk about what's going on at Tenbound and how people might be able to find you if they were interested enough to try to do so. Yeah, I mean, we have a ton of free, you know, research and how-to guides and stuff on sales development. It's T-E-N-B-O-U-N-D.com, tenbound.com. And um, we, we're having that virtual conference uh, coming up here in, at, in the summer. So uh, it's free and would love to see you there. So there you have it. So look him up. He's on LinkedIn. That's how we found each other. I really enjoyed having a discussion today. Dave, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you.